This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Sometimes a traumatic event leaves its imprint on a property for quite some time. A traumatic event will also obviously leave its imprint on a person who lives through it and experiences it for quite some time, if not forever, in many cases. You can move away from where the event happened. You can be far away from the physical location but those events are still there, imprinted in your mind, the trauma of it. What happens if you inadvertently return to the scene of where that trauma took place? What if that trauma involved someone dying? And what if that person who died also returns as you return at the same time? In our next story, we hear about a group of teenagers doing what teenagers do, hanging out, playing games, one game of which is called Ouija. And they discover they've unleashed something or opened a door in a home that had quite a traumatic experience happen in it and brought back the spirit of someone who had taken their own life there. One of the teenagers was there when the event originally took place. They were able to give some guidance as to who, what, and why this night went from teenage hijinks to teenage horror. Take a listen. I'm 27, live in a small city in Ohio. When I was 16, I met this chick named Becca. We got along good, and to this day, she's my best friend. The same day we met, I found out that she lived in a house that I was way too familiar with. Another best friend of mine, Mo, had lived there a few years back, and my uncle dated her mom, so I stayed with him regularly. You want to remember this for later in the story. It wasn't very long after I met Becca that I was practically living with her and her family, which consisted of her, her younger sister, Nikki, and her father. Her mom passed away years before I met them. I loved staying with them because her dad worked a 12-hour night shift at our town's local steel mill, and he was naive to what young girls left home alone at night could and would get into. But it was awesome. We always had sleepovers with a few of our other closest friends, and at that age, we were experimenting new things. We're smoking pot. It's one of our favorite trials. We really liked to play our music loudly and dance and laugh and have a good time. One of our biggest joys was prank calling the hottest boys in school and other girls that we just didn't like. I'll put it this way. Whatever we did, we had a good time. Well, one night I'll never forget. It was in June of 06 and it was on a Friday and it was storming outside. It was close to midnight. It was me, Becca, Kristen, Angel, and another girl named Angie. We were all in Becca's room having a good time. Nikki, Becca's younger sister, was in their dad's room asleep. We just finished smoking and we were all higher than we should have been. And Angie says, hey, look what I brought. And she pulls out a Ouija board. Yeah. All the girls were excited and ready to play. I, on the other hand, was very skeptical. I was afraid of what they were going to bring to the surface. But they talked me into it and I wish they hadn't. We lit candles, turned the lights out. Windows in the bedroom were open because it was so smoky. I got very quiet. All you could hear was the rain, the thunder cracking outside. So we all sat there with our two little fingers on the small plastic planchette, and one of the girls asked if there were any spirits present. We all watched for a couple minutes with anticipation. Nothing. Again, if there are any spirits here, let yourself be known. Or something along those lines. We were all 
concentrating so deeply on this board, and then out of nowhere, Nikki from the other room screamed and ran into our room crying. She was literally shaking, saying there was a man standing over her in the other room and that she thought that he had walked into the closet. Suddenly, there was a loud crash of thunder that scared the mess out of all of us. We turned the lights on quickly and cautiously walked towards the other room. One of us with a baseball bat, one with a baton, and Becca had grabbed a big knife out of the kitchen. There was a light shining out of the room from the TV playing, but the rest of the room was dark. Becky reached her hand inside and flipped the light on and gave the door a push so we could all see inside. Kristen was on the phone with her mom. We only stayed about two or three minutes away, and her mom said she'd be right there. So with all six of us inside her dad's room, we were still scared to open the closet. A minute later, the doorbell rang. Kind of gave us all a chill, but it was Kristen's mom. We told her what happened minus the Ouija board. She opened the closet door, and one of our cats jumped out. Made Kristen's mom scream a little. We all got a good laugh out of it, but no one knew how Buttons, our cat, had gotten in there. Chris's mom checked around the rest of the house, including the basement, and everything was okay, so she left us there and told us to call her back if we needed to. Well, needless to say, Nick ended up staying in our room the rest of the night, and when she was able to fall asleep, I decided to tell the girls what I knew. And this is it. After my uncle and Francis Mo's mom broke up, I wasn't allowed to stay there very often because my mom was told that Francis had started using hardcore drugs and that she was partying a lot. Francis started seeing a new man named John, who I'd met a few times. He seemed like a nice guy. He'd take us back and forth to the roller end and things like that, but Mo had told us of her mom and John fighting a lot. Well, the last night I stayed in that house before I met Becca was one of the craziest nights of my life. I and two other girls, Laura and Amanda, were sleeping over at Moe's. We were in her room, which is the same room that was now Becca's. We were listening to music and stuffing our faces with a normal sleepover junk food and just enjoying ourselves when Francis and John started arguing. First, they were in the living room, and we heard her say, Where is it? And John. And he said, There isn't any. And they went into their room, which is now Becca's dad's room. A few minutes had passed where we could hear them shouting back and forth and it sounded like a glass had been busted on the other side of the wall. Mo went to knock on her mom's door. She was worried that her mom was getting beat up. All of a sudden, we heard a loud bang and heard Francis's screaming John's name. Mo opened the door and Francis started screaming at her to get out. Mo saw a portion of John lying on the bed and blood all over. Francis was screaming for all of us to get out of the house. She said, get help. We were scared. We didn't know what happened. We all ran next door to Mo's grandma's house where her younger brother and sister were staying for the night. Mo started telling her grandma what was going on and to call the police. Frances, within one minute or so, ran over crying and had blood all over her. She was screaming to call the police. John, John, he's dead. We all started flipping out, crying and shit. He had killed himself. Shot himself right in the head. The police came and investigated and interviewed all of us. All our parents had to come for us to be released to them. I was only 12 when this happened. I'll never forget that night. After that, Mo's mom had to go to rehab, and she spent several months in a psychiatric hospital in Pennsylvania. Mo and her brother and sister moved away with their grandma when all this stuff happened with the Ouija board. I knew in my heart that the man Nick saw was John. I could feel it in my soul. When I finished telling everyone my story, Angel started to cry as she grabbed onto my arm. She pointed to a window in the room where the porch was, and there was a shadow standing there, like it was watching or listening. All of us started scooting on our butts with our backs towards the bedroom door, keeping our eyes focused on the window. I said, thanks for watching out for us, John, but you can go now. You're scaring us. And without the shadow moving in any direction, it just disappeared. It was gone. And we all still tell this story to this day. I think if he had not shown his shadow to us on the porch right at that time, then my friends would not have believed me only because it was such a traumatic experience. Before I moved in with Becca and her family, when I first told my mom where she lived, my mom told me that if I went there, that I was going to see him again. She also told me to tell them what had happened there in that house. I still have trouble talking about it. I wanted to tell them 
and I thought about it often. I just could not bring myself to say it. I've not seen Monica for many years now, and I see the other girls who were there that night very seldom, but when we do run into each other, there's a silence that we all know well. The first time I saw Laura after I had this experience with John's ghost, I had to explain to her in detail what had happened that night, and there was such a heaviness in the air, and we were both chilled to the bone with goosebumps. Real Ghost Stories Online. Want a commercial-free experience of the show with access to the world's largest audio archive of ghost stories? Sign up at Apple Podcasts right now and try it for three days free. Ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories.